So my name is uh, Sonia Bacca, and I am the deputy director of the MITP. And I have the pleasure to make the opening for your workshop on supergravity and holography. So uh, this uh, is a particular pleasure because it is the first uh, event that we have uh, of the new series, uh, Young Stars or Youngsters. It's uh, like you can read it the way you want. So uh, I would like to say a few words about uh, how this program was born. So as you may know, the MITP is an institute where we organize uh, uh, workshops and programs and the way it works is that we have usually a call for proposals out at the beginning of the year then the scientists send in their proposal and which are reviewed by a committee um, by the board who's made by members of the community some are accepted uh, some are not uh, and usually what you observe is that uh, um, scientists who propose these uh, programs are typically senior scientists with occasionally some young people now, during this pandemic, we had to, uh, of course, um, move a lot of uh, uh, the programs that workshop online. So we realized that if you really want to focus on the positive things of this uh, pandemic, what we had is a larger attendance, so many more people could uh, um, attend. But then we thought, hey, so if we have this opportunity to be online, why don't we create a special space for young people who are the most seriously affected by the pandemic. Because I think if you are a student, in, uh, a PhD student in the transition to a postdoc level or a postdoc in the transition to your faculty level, this is exactly the moment where you need your networking the most. So that's why this uh, uh, Youngsters uh, was born. And I think, um, so I'm very happy that I can have the honor to open this. Uh, and uh, we uh, hope uh, to also have this in the future in the, when hopefully this pandemic will be over. So thanks a lot, uh, Lucrezia, Riccardo, Ruggiero for taking the lead in organizing this. I think this is your chance. And uh, uh, the only thing I can say is that I wish you on behalf of the entire MITP team, a very successful workshop with lots and lots of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, your, for the introduction. Thank you, Sonia. So welcome to Supergravity and uh, Holography Workshop. I'm uh, Riccardo Matricano, one of the organizers. The other two are Ruggero and uh, Lucrezia. You can, uh, you, you will uh, meet them uh, in the next days. First of all, I want to um, thank you, the Mainz Institute uh, for Theoretical Physics, uh, for giving us this opportunity as young research. Secondly, I want to thank you, the speakers, for accepting uh, our invitations. And uh, I want also to thank you, the participants. Uh, <clears throat> about the schedule, we will have uh, three days uh, of a workshop, uh, two, two seminars per day of a one hour each. Between the first and the second uh, uh, talk, we will have a 10 minutes break. And uh, between the second and uh, the discussion, we will have a, ten, uh, tw uh, 20 minutes break. The discussion will, uh, will, be, of, uh, one, will be one hour long. Uh, concerning the, the questions, uh, uh, you can uh, put uh, you can ask your, your questions during the discussion, obviously, but also at the end of every, of, of every talk, there will be five, 10 minutes devoted to the, to the questions. I remember that this is a live workshop uh, with only two talks per day. So you are uh, very encouraged to put uh, questions and uh, to discuss about uh, the, the talks. So I don't want to steal other minutes to our uh, to our uh, speakers. Uh, today we will have uh, uh, Jorge Zanelli from the Center of Studies of Scientific Studies in Valdivia, and uh, Laura Andianopoli from Polytechnic of uh, Turin. They will talk about uh, they will talk about unconventional supersymmetry. So if uh, Donelli is ready, I will uh, pass him the, uh, the ball. I mean. 
Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you. Uh, I'm ready, yes. But the connection is very unstable, so I hope it continues oh. to continue to transmit. Um, I will switch off my camera and I will share my presentation. Okay, thank you. So uh, hopefully that will help in the transmission. Okay. Um, okay, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much to the, to the organizers for the for being the first speaker in this uh, first version of this series of conferences or workshops. Um, it's a real pleasure to see so many friendly faces and so many old friends attending this seminar. It's a real honor for me to, to speak here now. So um, what I want to present is, um, is a, a work that we have been developing in our group in Valdivia and uh, with our colleagues in Torino over the last decade or so. And uh, it's uh, an unveiling which to history. Um, and uh, in the end, you will probably, un but it's unconventional in the scope, in the way we present the ideas. But in the end, it's going to be good old supersymmetry that we all love and like. So um, this uh, work is being done in collaboration with these people in Chile and these friends in Torino. And uh, this is a list of some of the papers that we produced in the last decade. Um, so uh, supersymmetry is, if you, if you look at Wikipedia, uh, supersymmetry is a space of symmetry between both and some terms in which for each particle, there is an associated particle of the other spin with different uh, spin statistics. So bosons and fermions are combined and they transform under the action with supersymmetric charge. This is an idea that stems back of uh, 50 years. Um, it was developed initially by a group of Russian uh, mathematicians and physicists and independently by two uh, research in the US, Ejerbe and Sakita who came more or less to the same conclusion, to the same ideas at the same, more or less at the same time. Uh, now, the, the, the idea of supersymmetry was a very lovely idea. It was a very uh, interesting and uh, probably the most um, uh, compelling idea of that time. And when I was a graduate student, I fell in love with supersymmetry immediately. Well, supersymmetry makes fermions and bosons necessary to each other. I mean, you could not conceive supersymmetry without them. Uh, it, it explains, therefore, why we have two types of particles in nature, in a way. <clears throat> it also restricts the particle multiplets that you can produce in, in the supersymmetric theory. It, it's not a free, uh, it's, it's not an arbitrary symmetry that you can put on an arbitrary combination of particles. Also, the masses and coupling constants of these particles have been be related. Uh, moreover, it provides positive energy theorems and, and therefore stability of the theories are expected to, uh, um, to be a consequence of supersymmetry. Also, improves three normal stability by uh, producing cancellations of infinities between bosons and fermions. And the other thing that it's also appealing for model building is that it respects hierarchy. So it protects the mass scales of different particles or interactions. And all of these things are welcome in a theory, uh, a unified theory of particles. However, after so many years, uh, there's been a lot of search for supersymmetric uh, evidence of supersymmetry and not, none has been found. And so some people have was uh, said that maybe supersymmetry is dead, is dead end, is not a possibility in nature, maybe supersymmetry is, is a completely unsound idea and we should forget about it. Uh, other people continue to work on it and uh, even to consider, conceive other ways of implementing supersymmetry. And what I'm going to tell you today is some, an, an alternative way of circumventing all, some of these problems. So uh, first of all, what is supersymmetry expected to do? What, is the, what was the hope of supersymmetry? Why was supersymmetry invented? 
Well, the idea was that in the 60s that space-time symmetries helped produce representations of particles in the asymptotic region. So the energy and momentum of particles uh, would correspond to conserved charges of the Lorentz or the Poincaré group. And the same thing would be true about the spin or the angular momentum and the conservation charges, uh, the conserved charges of these uh, groups would correspond to labels of particles. So particles could be labeled by spin and mass as, as, uh, as these are the Casimir operators of the Poincaré group. On the other hand, there were internal symmetries that were emerging and they were observed in, the, in scattering processes. Apart from the electromagnetic interaction, there was the SU2 and the SU3 symmetries. And these internal symmetries also produced conserved charges and selection rules. And this uh, uh, led to some quantum numbers and classification of particles. So there, it was a hope that maybe these two type of symmetries could be combined in a larger one. And then at the end of the 60s, there was a, this bad news of a theorem by Coleman and Mandula, who showed that any Lie algebra that contains both an internal and a space time symmetry, that is a symmetry or could be a symmetry of the ace matrix, can only be a trivial product of the two or some direct sum of the two algebras. Uh, and therefore, there would be nothing very unifying about them. Uh, then, in 1970s, there appeared this funny article where some Russian physicists thought of the idea of using the, uh, the uh, some symmetry that combines space-time and internal symmetry to describe the neutrino. And uh, this was a counterexample to the previous the Coleman-Mandula uh, theorem because it showed that there could be a symmetry which is non-trivial and which includes space-time and internal symmetries in a combined, in a reusable way. Uh, so this circumventing of Coleman-Mandula theorem was not understood immediately, but after a while it was seen that this was possible because there was a, an extension by Haglo, Bushansky, and Sonius uh, that showed that you could actually do this. You could have internal symmetries and space-time symmetries combined if you had a supersymmetric generator, an anti-commuting generator in the algebra. And this is the, the structure of supersymmetric theories. So space-time symmetries could be part of a graded Lie algebra, not an ordinary Lie algebra. And this was why the uh, aculo folko uh, paper could actually exist. Now, fermions are an essential feature in this uh, construction because fermions sort of fill both space-time symmetries, so they are representations of the Lorentz group, and also fill internal symmetries. They are representations of the electromagnetic weak and strong interactions. So they are vectors under the gauge connection and under the Lorentz group, or the spinners, if you wish, more precisely, under the Lorentz group. So the fact that fermions belong to these two uh, worlds, or they interact with these two worlds, is represented by the fact that there is also there is always a connection of the Lorentz group or of the internal group that couples in a minimal way with the fermions. So this is the hallmark that explains why fermions are essential for unifying these two types of symmetries, because they can couple to those connections, connections of these two groups. So matter of fermions, I mean electrons, quarks, and leptons and quarks in general, both to internal gauge fields and to space-time geometry because of this. So the, the, the fact that we have spin is responsible for the fact that electromagnetic interactions uh, with matter exist. And the fact that we have representations of the Lorentz group explains that why matter is heavy and can be uh, attracted by gravitation. Now, the standard supersymmetry, or the most, uh, the simplest form of supersymmetry was uh, is this sort of vector representation where you could put in a vector of both sons and fermions together, and the supersymmetric generator changes and makes it them in a way, in a, in a, in a non-trivial way. Now, this uh, rigid form of supersymmetry was developed by many people in, in the 70s, 
And in the simplest representation of this, or the simplest realization is the Poincaré algebra, where the supersymmetric generator is closed on the Hamiltonian. And being a conserved charge, that meant that the supersymmetric generator had to commute with the Hamiltonian. And that led to the fact that the energy eigenstates in a supersymmetric model would be degenerate. So bosons and fermions, this gentleman that appear in this vector representation would have to correspond to the same energy. And also there will be in equal numbers, bosons and fermions, because for each of these you have another of the other type, and therefore you have to have matching number of bosonic and fermionic states in a supersymmetric theory. Now, none of these two features uh, has been uh, observed, or it's not a, even approximately true. So the, that concludes, that means that supersymmetry must be severely broken. Now, uh, there was a comment that Paul Dirac made to Salam in 1976 when Salam was giving a lecture on supersymmetry and supergravity. And he said, if this symmetry were true, it would have been discovered a long time ago. In this fact, if you could, if you had this type of uh, feature, it would have been evident or apparent in any table of particles, and, and that was not seen. Now, the standard model, on the other hand, shows something completely different. Fermions and bosons play very different roles in, in nature in the standard model. Fermions are these continuous uh, block, uh, arrow lines, and uh, bosons are these weakly interacting intermediate interactions, of, and they are created and destroyed at every vertex. Whereas the fermions are continuous lines that cannot be created or destroyed, they don't end. Uh, and this has very strong consequences, and it's very hard to imagine that these two types of particles could be symmetrically uh, combined. If you look at the standard model, you have the, uh, the leptons and quarks here, and you have the interactions. Leptons and quarks are matter sources. They, are, they constitute the electrons and nuclei of atoms. And they are all fermions with so spin one half. They are uh, vectors under the gauge uh, group and the fundamental representation. They are space time scalars, they're zero forms, and they transform under the Lorentz group as Lorentz spinners. They also satisfy first order field equations. So, dynamically, this is what a fermion is represented by. On the other hand, the bosons are interaction carriers. They have spin one gauge connections and not gauge vectors. They are space time vectors because they are one forms and not space time scalars. They are Lorentz scalars, not Lorentz vectors or spinners, and they satisfy second order field equations. Now, the only exception to this table is the Higgs boson that we really don't know where, it, where we can put because it's a, it's a boson, but it's still it's a spin zero particle, not a spin one, and so forth. But except for the Higgs boson, this is a this is the role of matter and fermions, and this is the role of interactions and bosons. So in order to try to accommodate this into a supersymmetric model, it's very hard. If you write down the Lagrangian for fermion, the Lagrangian has this form, the, in this field of fermion has this spin one half representation of the Lorentz group and may carry a vector index for the gauge group. It transforms under the Lorentz transformations in a vector or a spinner representation, and under the gauge group, transforms a vector in the gauge group. Bosons, on the other hand, have a very different Lagrangian. They are quadratic in the fields and the derivatives, so they satisfy second order field equations. Uh, and they have a different representation than in the adjoint representation of the gauge group. And under the gauge transformation, they transform uh, as connections. Now, the supersymmetric standard model, uh, therefore, carried calls for us, apart from the particles that we see, the bosons and leptons and Higgs that we see, there will be a supersymmetric duplicates of them. These are the observed particles in the standard model. These are not observed, and therefore, this must be very, very heavy. Uh, maybe they can also explain things like dark matter in nature. But with the particles we see are the light particles that correspond to the standard, the standard observables. And these heavy supersymmetric partners or shadows are, should be there. 
uh, and they would have the same, almost all of the same charges or same uh, features except for the spin. Now, none of this has been seen, uh, whereas all of these have been seen and therefore supersymmetry must be severely broken. Now, what is this, the supersymmetry breaking mechanism? It's not clear. And why these are so heavy, it's not clear either. So that's a, an important riddle that has been with us for many, many years. Now, if you want to construct a supersymmetric standard model, you have to add or change a few parameters and you have to adjust about 100 parameters in the, in the model. So the initial appeal of the standard model, which is a simple and uh, sound expression for a couple, to accommodate all the particles, becomes very messy. So it is like when uh, Ptolemyus uh, explains the motion of planets by adding more and more epicycles to explain why the Earth is at the center of the universe and the sun goes around it and the planets go around in epicycles. And this was the observation by Alphonse X, uh, king of Spain in the, in the 13th century, said if the Lord had consulted in my opinion, I would have suggested something considerably. I think it applies to the model. Now, what is the wish list? What we would like to see in a supersymmetric model? Well, we would like to see bosons and frames under, that combine under some symmetry that unifies them. But this symmetry should respect their different roles as connections and sections in the fiber bundle or in the gauge interaction. They should give the right kinetic terms uh, and the right couplings in between fermions and bosons. They should not duplicate the field, so hopefully there will be no uh, supersymmetric partners. Uh, should allow also for the fermions to acquire mass and for the bosons to remain mostly massless, like the photon, for instance. It should hopefully contain only the spin one and spin one half fields that we see, and the rest may be composites. I mean, spin higher spins could be composites of these two, and also spin zero could be composite of them. And also, hopefully, it could allow for curved space-time dynamics so that this could be embedded in a theory that contains uh, gravity. Now, these features are not there to be seen in any standard supersymmetric or supergravity theory up to now. Now, let me talk now about the unconventional approach to supersymmetry. Well, the basic idea is the following. If you have an adjoint representation of a group, representation of a group, the observation is that you can combine these two representations of a group, in this case SO3, into a larger representation that's also adjoint but four. And you put in a large array, the connection and vector components in this way, this becomes an adjoint representation of a larger group. If you think of it in terms of generators, you can have the uh, generators in the adjoint representation and the generators in the vector representation, and you can combine the, both of them into a larger algebra of generators of the larger group in the adjoint representation in this fashion. Now, this allows to combine connections and vectors of a given group into a larger group of the time. So now when bosons belong to the joint representations and fermion belongs to the vector representation, you can do the same thing for the super algebra. And this is the idea of the unconventional approach. So if you take uh, the generators, let's say the internal gauge symmetries and the Lorentz generator and the Lorentz algebra, then you can add the generators of supersymmetry and fermions together with them. And this produces a new connection that contains all the generators of an extended algebra. Now, this algebra may, has to close and may, you may need to add an additional set of generators in order for the whole algebra to close. This idea was uh, is, uh, initially studied by Magdawal and Mansouri in 1976 and also by um, uh, by Townsend around that same time to, in, to produce a supergravity super theory in four dimensions. 
And this idea was also discussed in, in many, by many people in, in studying with Chamsedin um, and our own group when we studied Chern Simon's gravities and supergravities in odd dimensions and for many different theories. So the idea of extending a connection and representing supersymmetry through a connection and not a vector representation was, a, was one essential idea. The second idea is the, the so-called matter ansatz. The idea is that there is a technical issue with this construction. If you look at this, this is a one form, the connections are one forms, and so is the internal gauge generator, the gauge connection is also one form, and also the Lorentz connection is also one form. But this means that this fermion, chi, should also be a one form. Now, a one form is the spinner under the coordinate transformation. So it's a, it's a spin three half or, or a spin one plus one half representation of the Lorentz group. Now, if this is an irreducible representation, it would be a spin three half, and that's not in the standard model. But you can consider this ob object that has a vector and a spinner index as something that has a spin one half field and a, ma a gamma matrix, where this gamma matrix is just a, 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 Lorentz, a gamma matrix in the Lorentz uh, representation with a field line, because if you are not in ordinary coordinates, you need to add a soldering form. And now this gamma matrix is satisfied, the, uh, uh, the, the Dirac matrix is satisfied a, a, a Clifford algebra, and this field line is a metric structure of the manifold. So with the aid of the uh, Clifford uh, uh, algebra and the matrix structure of the manifold, you can construct this representation for this uh, connection or field. Uh, and this spin, uh, this psi field would be a standard spin one half spinner. In this way, uh, this object that is in this uh, direct product or direct uh, sum of the representation of three half and one half, uh, we, when you use this matter answers, you eliminate the spin three half com uh, co uh, component. So the, instead of having uh, a spin three half field, and like in supergravity, you would have a spin one half field, like in the standard model. Now in standard supergravity, uh, it, it is assumed that the uh, gravitino satisfies this constraint. And this constraint eliminates the spin one half component. In our case, in our supersymmetry, uh, we have not this component to be killed, but we kill the spin three half component. And the result is a spin one half field. So the unconventional supersymmetry uses the discarded sector of the supergravity theories. Now, if you put that all together, what you have is a representation where the spin connection, I'm, I'm sorry, where the, 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 this, uh, the connection part of the spinner is carried by these gamma matrices. These are the, these are the uh, Clifford algebra combined with the, uh, with the soldering form, the metric form. So now the connection takes this form, there are internal, sy internal symmetry generators with the connection, the space-time symmetry generators with the connections and the spin one half part. Now these are ordinary spin one bosons and these are spin zero, or spin one half, uh, zero forms, fermions. Now, in this example, for instance, in three dimensions, you could have the SU2 group for the internal symmetries, the uh, Lorentz group here, and the supersymmetric generators, and this form an algebra, which is the algebra SU1, SU12 bar two. And this is the algebra. So the Lorentz group, this is standard form, the SU2 group has also the standard form and these two parts commute, but the supersymmetry generators close on the internal and the Lorentz part, and they have their representations of both this, uh, the spin one half representation of the Lorentz group and uh, fundamental representation of the internal gauge group. Now, all the fields are uh, scalar, all these fields are connections, the connection fields are 
the scalars and the general coordinate transformations. And therefore, general covariance is automatically built in in the spin, this system. Now, this system has a metric structure. As I said, these gamma matrices are combined with the metric structure. And they have a Lorentz symmetry, and therefore they include all the ingredients of gravity. Now, how do you construct an action with this? Now, uh, an action would be uh, a Lagrangian, it would be defined by the Lagrangian, which would be functionals of these fields, uh, the, the, these connections. And in the case of odd dimensions, the construction is very simple. You can construct always the chern simons form in any odd dimension. With, with a given connection, as we wrote down before, we just plug in here and we take the invariant trace of the algebra and that defines the action. Now, in even dimensions, there is no possibility of John Simons forms. In even dimensions, you can only hope for the Young Mills theories. And Young Mills uh, requires uh, the construction of of something like this, which is bilinear in the curvatures. The curvatures are just given by the curvatures of these connections, and brackets with an invariant trace, where this star here is a generalized Hodge dual. So it, this works in any dimension, but this John Simons form works only in D in odd dimensions. Uh, in the simplest example, then it's a three dimensional case. You can write down the Lagrangian, which is given by the John Simons form in three dimensions with this connection that I mentioned before, the SU12 bar 2 connection. And when you write down this bracket, what you get is a Lagrangian, which looks very, very conventional. It looks like the John Simons action Lagrangian for SU2 the churn simons for the Lorentz group, and a Dirac Lagrangian for the spin one half field. There's an additional piece here because of the, that in the, this field by an in the fermionic side, this gives rise to the coupling between the fermions and the torsion uh, of space-time. Now, this happens to be the long limit of graphene, so it is an interesting model for uh, the description of graphene if the graphene is has to. Now, the field equations are very standard, the, the electromagnetic fermions. Uh, the Lorentz curvature has the source also given by the first content of the first. The Dirac equation describes the fermion, and there is a coupling with the mass term. This mass term comes from the torsion. It's just an invariant uh, torsion piece in three dimensions. That uh, if, the, if the manifold has torsion, then the, this fermion acquires mass. And it turns out that this is a constant in this model. When, when the curvature satisfies this condition, the torsion must be constant, and therefore this is a, this is a real mass term. Uh, then you can also do this, or you can play the same game in four dimensions, and then you can consider, for instance, the minimal extension of SU2 and SU3-1, SO so you have an internal SU2 symmetry and an SO3-1 uh, Lorentz group. And this leads to OSP42. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the connection takes this form. The supersymmetry algebra closes on the internal symmetry and the Lorentz group. And the curvature takes this form. Now, in four dimensions, we need to construct the uh, Young Mills form for the Lagrangian. And uh, so this uh, requires the, the curvature. The curvature is just the electromagnetic curvature. The, internal SU2 curvature, the Dirac uh, curvature, and all the other things. Now, this uh, contains here the SO32, so the anti de Sitter group. So besides the Lorentz group, the Lorentz connection, you have the generators of uh, anti de Sitter boosts, and th these are the fields corresponding to that, the connection to that. So that also has a curvature, and this is the Lorentz curvature. Now, this is the SO32 
part of the curvature. This is the U1, SU2, and the supersymmetry part of the curvature. Putting all of this together, we, want, we can construct the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian has this generalized Hodge, which is an ordinary Hodge for the internal symmetry, has the uh, Hodge in the Lorentz connection, in the Lorentz uh, indices for the space-time part, and has a gamma phi in the Dirac in the part for the Fermi part. And with all this put together, you, you can write down the Lagrangian and we observe the following. The new, uh, this resulting Lagrangian, because of this bracket, that is only SU2 and SO31 invariant, there is no, uh, there is no bracket that is invariant under the entire algebra that produces a Lagrangian in four dimensions, as I will talk to that about that in a minute. Uh, then the complete OSP42 symmetry is broken down to this symmetry, SU2 cross SO31. So the, the, the maximum symmetry that this Lagrangian can have is the internal symmetry times the Lorentz symmetry. This is the largest gauge symmetry of the action. In this case, uh, the generators of boosts, uh, ADS boosts, uh, are not part of the symmetry of the Lagrangian, and therefore the connection pieces, that the, the field that accompany them, are no longer gauge fields. Putting together the Lagrangian, you, you find that this is the expression. You have the Maxwell or Young Mills part. You have the Dirac part, which has a, 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 uh, a coupling with the torsion also. There is an ambujon and a senior term in which is a four Fermi interaction. And there is the Einstein Hilbert uh, term plus the cosmological constant. This derivative is a standard derivative of the, the minimally coupled fermion to the U1 and U2 field to the Lorentz connection and to the space-time translations. There are no uh, second derivative of the fermions. And uh, the only constant of this thing comes from the fact that the, you have to identify the generator of uh, ADS boost with the field lines because they have the same quantum numbers or the same features. And there is a num numerical or uh, constant that relates the two. And this gives rise to the cosmological constant and to the Newton's constant. Now, the only new thing in the fermions, apart from the torsion coupling, is this Nambuyo Nalacino term, which was not expected in the, in the theory without supersymmetry. This is given by supersymmetry. Now, this Lagrangian is phenomenologically reasonable, although energy is in four dimensions. And this, this, there's nothing un unusual about it. And it uh, comes from supersymmetry. Now, as I mentioned, there was no, uh, in, in, the, in the previous case, there was uh, this symmetry uh, under the entire group is broken down to this symmetry. And the reason is that there is no invariant object that you can construct in four dimensions. Let me show you, explain why that is the case. Now, indeed, in four dimensions, in, in general, in, in, in even dimension, the only invariant four forms constructed with the, with the curvature are characteristic classes. This is the chern weil theorem. There is nothing else that you can construct which is invariant. So the uh, next thing that you can do is to have something which is not invariant under the entire group, but something that is invariant under the largest subgroup of the full symmetry group. And this rules out SO32 as invariant action, for instance, for anti sitter and it has to be broken down to the Lorentz group. And breaking the anti sitter group to the Lorentz group, group also breaks down supersymmetry to, uh, to, to something which is, does not close. So the only surviving symmetry, local symmetry of the action is U1, SU2, and SO31. Supersymmetry is necessarily broken. So supersymmetry is not an invariance of the action. However, there can be some particular supersymmetric invariant vacua or configurations, which are essentially BPS states. 
This is the same similar to what happens with the Poincaré group. You can construct an action with the connection for the Poincaré group. Translations will be broken, and therefore, in general, the Poincaré group will not be a symmetry of the uh, Lagrangian. The largest subgroup that will be a gauge, sub gauge group of the algebra, uh, the Lagrangian will be the Lorentz group. And, but there might be some, super, some invariant vacua that are also uh, invariant on the translations. Namely, if you, have, if you happen to be very far from any sources in flat space, that's a vacuum that is also invariant on the Poincaré group. So local supersymmetry could at best be an approximate symmetry for some configurations or in some asymptotic regions in the same way as the Poincaré or the NDS invariants are symmetries in some cases. So we call this a contingent symmetry. These are therefore supersymmetry is not a fundamental gauge symmetry of nature, but it's a contingent symmetry of some states. Now in in all dimensions, transformations of supersymmetry look like this. Uh, the, the bosonic fields transform in a very simple way with the fermions. The connections transform like this. And the fermion transforms in this way, uh, where the, the metric structure is invariant. So under this supersymmetry, the metric structure does not enter in the supersymmetric algebra. And uh, what this whole thing means is that the connection comes from as a as a exterior derivative is uh, contracted with some gamma matrices of some supersymmetric parameter. Uh, now the the action changes by boundary term with this, so that would be a genuine uh, gauge symmetry in all dimensions. However, this constraint, uh, the the fact that the 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 fermi this fermion has to to be a spin one half constrains the solution of these possible equations. Now, in particular, the bosonic vacua, like if you have fermions put to zero, would be invariant provided this is equal to zero. And that means that the vacuum must admit killing spinners. Those, uh, that is again a, a symptom that the supersymmetry in this case is an, it's a conditional symmetry. It's a, uh, uh, it's a symmetry that depends on the vacuum. Now, if there are n globally defined killing spinners, that means that there are n unbroken global supersymmetries in the system. And this, again, is a conditional symmetry that depends on the vacuum. It cannot be generalized in all cases. So let me summarize what I've been telling you. So the main ingredients of this unconventional approach is to take an ad a joint representation of a group and a fundamental representation of a group and put them together in a joint representation of a larger group. And the connection, you take the space-time symmetry generators and the connection fields for that. You take the fermions and the internal symmetries and combine all of these into a big connection. We use the matter ansatz in which this is the you know, vector is just a product of a uh, gamma matrices with the spin one half field, and this uh, satisfies this constraint that kills the spin three half part of this field, this Fermi field. Then there is an invariant trace in the algebra of the, the group, of the group G prime here. So with that invariant trace, you can construct, in the case of all dimensions, the chern simons form. And in the case of even dimensions, you use a Hodge dual to construct the young mills Lagrangian. Now, what are the consequences? What is new? Well, first, all fields are part of the same super connection. Matter, fermions and, and bosons are, are part of the of the super connection package in a, in a big connection. So these sections and connections combine in a connection. Now, not all internal space symmetries are allowed. Some, some combinations of them are necessary only. And it only involves the spin one half and one. All the fundament, other fundamental fields, all the fundamental fields are these. The, any other fields like spin zero, or three half, or two can be composites. Only the standard kinetic terms appear, so the young mills dirac and Simons connections would have the right kinetic terms, and they would have the standard couplings. There will be no weird couplings like this, for instance. There are no supersymmetric pairs and no matching of degrees of freedom and no hidden sectors. 
And now what is new? Well, uh, we, we have a number of coupling constants which are fixed and the masses or the mass parameters are also fixed. In all dimensions, the action is invariant under the gauge supergroup. In even dimensions, the action is not invariant under the supergroup and its supersymmetry is a, con is a conditional symmetry. However, the vacua f equals zero enjoy the entire superalgebra, are invariant in the entire superalgebra, and therefore they are supersymmetric vacua. These are BPS states. Now, the, the new thing is the Nambujo and Alassino couplings among fermions, which are unexpected, and also gravity is necessarily included. Uh, so you have spinners in the tangent space and uh, that requires the presence of the field mind. You have Lorentz symmetry and it requires a spin connection and the combined things contain ordinary gravity. So in the end, what is the role of supersymmetry working? Well, it is a guiding principle for construct theory. It relates space-time and internal groups that can be combined it defines the superalgebra and the gauge couplings, the coupling constants, and fixes the masses in the Lagrangian. It includes a necessary presence of gravity. That's also something new. Uh, and it also uh, shows that the invariance of the, under the supergroup is uh, broken. So the only uh, remaining symmetry is the internal symmetry group and the Lorentz group, which is what we see in nature. The invariance under the entire supergroup could be there for some vacua, so there could be BPS states, and that could mean that there could be classification of states due to the supercharges and the ordinary uh, charges of the entire group also. Now, there are open questions like what are the observable effects? For instance, in graphene, what happens if you, in, if you insist in, super, in looking at graphene as a supersymmetric system? What would be the conserved charges or the observables in that case? What would be the vacua of all these uh, supersymmetric theories? Uh, what happens with the normalizability? So far, I've been talking about the classical aspects of theory. Uh, what happens with the hierarchy? Is this going to respect masses, uh, hierarchy uh, of interactions, and so forth? Uh, is it possible to extend this to larger groups, to more complicated groups like SU1, SU2, and SU3 that we would like to see for the standard model? Now, the other thing is that uh, for any, for your favorite super, super gravity theory, where you have the sort of Radita Schwinger interaction or Churn, uh, the Rita Schwinger kinetic term, you can do, or you can write down this Rita Schwinger in the mass, uh, in the matter ansatz as a combination of the field bind, the, the gamma matrices, and the spin one half. And what you get is a Dirac Lagrangian. So, in any supergravity theory, you could have a, somehow residing inside that theory a Dirac theory with interactions with other fields. So you can now you, you can have an industry of new matter theories with spin one half fields derived from the supergravity theories. Now, the other question, uh, it's an open question, is how to accommodate the Higgs boson in this story, and we have really no idea about that. So perhaps the conclusion is that maybe supersymmetry has been there for a long time and we haven't seen it because we have been looking for the wrong signals. We have been looking for particles with equal mass and, and different spins or for multiples or super partners in the wrong way. So maybe supergravity and supersymmetry are not dead. And it's like Mark Twain said, maybe the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to you for the very clear presentation, which uh, frames the unconventional uh, supersymmetry approach in the theoretical physics uh, background. So if uh, someone has uh, questions, we have uh, 10 minutes, I think. Yes, 10 or uh, 15 minutes for the questions. Uh, yeah, you can uh, switch on your uh, microphone now. Uh, oh. uh, sorry. No, uh, I'm trying. Uh. 
Okay. Like, I cannot on this. my video for some reason. There is a question by Olivera. Well, yes, hi, hello. <laughs> hi, how are you? Good. Uh, how thank, are you? Thanks uh, for the talk. It was uh, interesting as always. And I want to ask you uh, only, why do you use um, young meal section only in even dimensions? Because uh, there is no problem to define it in any. Why do you choose uh, Chen Simons in odd? Okay, we know why, because uh, they, they don't exist in even, but, uh, but um, young mills exist in any dimension. So why do you prefer Chen Simons than young mills? No, no, it's, it's, it's not forbidden. I mean, in odd dimensions, you can also use young mills, of course. Uh, I was only looking at the simplest examples and the simplest examples, in my opinion, is something that has the least number of ingredients. So uh, by the, if you want to introduce your meals, you have to have um, a metric uh, in, coming in, and that's uh, something that you can probably avoid or try to avoid in all dimensions. But you're right. I mean, you could use equally well young meals in all dimensions. There's nothing against that. Sure. And you can try Thank that. You. Sure. I have uh, one question uh, about yeah. um, uh, unconventional supersymmetry. Uh, wh where is the point where uh, the match of the degrees of freedom, bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom, uh, falls? I mean, uh, why in uh, uh, usual supersymmetry we have uh, the match and uh, in unconventional supersymmetry we don't have? Ah, okay, that's a very good question. I, let me share the screen again. Um, so, uh, I could try. No, I don't see. Okay. We see black. Uh, black. Yes, yes, black. Ah, okay. okay. Let me go to the presentation and uh, I will select it. Okay, this is the. This is what happens in standard supersymmetry. You have a vector representation of the group. So uh, you put bosons and fermions in a column, and then you act with a supersymmetric generator, which is in general a square matrix or something, or some differential operators or whatever. So for each bosonic state, you generate another fermionic state and so forth. And this produces a matching. Now in our uh, in the presentation, we, we have a completely different approach. We put everything, I mean, in this way. Um, so we have um, the number of bosons depends on the number of generators or bosonic generators, and the number of fermions depends on the number of components of the supersymmetry generators, which also corresponds to the vector representations of the uh, internal group. So uh, you, you have the number of Fermi fields that appear here are dictated by the representation of the algebra and not by a vector representation. It's not in, they are not in the fundamental representation of the algebra, they are in the adjoint representation of the subalgebra. And so the number of fields that appear in different bosonic and fermionic depends on how many generators you have of each kind. And these do not match in general. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, just to give you an example, for instance, if you take yes. the supersymmetric extension of the anti de Sitter group in five dimensions, which you use a Chen Simons connection, then you have something like 31 degrees of freedom for bosons and 32 degrees of freedom for fermions, something like that. I mean, they, they're wild numbers, they're very freak numbers. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question? Can I ask a question? Yes, yes. Hi, Jorge. Hola, Pedro. Um, well, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one question is about the asymptotic symmetries when you have supersymmetry. It's, it's actually not about the unconventional supersymmetry, it's just a general question about the uh, are those symmetries uh, known? 
You mean the extension, the supersymmetric extension of B, the BMS group? Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I have never studied that, but I suppose there could be a supersymmetric extension of the BMS group in the same way as there is a supersymmetric extension of the Poincare group. Um, mm -hmm. I would expect that to be true. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Does anybody know the answer? Maybe somebody here. I think that the group in uh, in um, Brussels by by Barnick. I think he studied the, this extension also to supersymmetry. I, I'm not sure, but I know that he worked a lot in this area, so he sure. probably have it. Yeah. Right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. In fact, maybe I can add that uh, regarding those works that you were mentioning, Pietro. Uh, in fact, there are a supersymmetric extension of the BMS uh, group. And for instance, uh, regarding four dimensional supersymmetric extension, they can both have a finite or an infinite number of fermionic uh, generators, depending uh, on, uh, there are several models on uh, that, so. That's nice. Thank you very much, Lucrezia. We have time. Yes. Sorry, yes. can I ask another question? Yes, yes. It's about the, um, uh, this, Unconventional supergravity with the gravitini and the, the matter answer, combining the two of them. Uh, do you have any guess of what is gonna, what kind of <laughs> models are you gonna get? Did you do that? No, I have no no idea. No, actually, it will be very interesting to see. Maybe one can take all the surveys on supergravity and for each model that you have to produce the corresponding. Uh, Spin one half representation. I don't know. It will be interesting to to see whether something new comes out. And I, of course, uh, usually the supergravitini is assumed to be a Majorana spinner. In many cases, it's in a very simple representation. Uh, they, I don't think they consider charge gravitini very much. Uh, maybe they have an O n symmetry or something like that, but very simple. So I don't think they gauge, they assume that the gravitini belong to some gauge uh, represent, uh, they belong, I don't think they, they are charged under some gauge group. I don't know, maybe somebody in this group knows. Well, I think that the gauge of gravity does it. I mean, uh, gauge of gravity yeah. is the need to make it charged under some gauge group. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree with uh, Antonio. In, I mean, if you take care, already at equal two, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but it's a, it's a matter of turning the crank. I mean, you just <laughs> extend supergravity or consider the supergravity descendant of it, or the spin one half descendant of those supergravity theories. I, I suppose it's a straightforward. But 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 already the n equal two supergravity, the the gravitino are charged and the gravity photon. In fact, the gravity photon is just a U one. Of the of the R symmetry group, which is gauged in this case. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. We have time for uh, a last question. I have a very short one, if I can ask one. Yes, please. It is it is related to this uh, spin one half, uh, which could be charged under some gauge group. So uh, my question is very naive. Have you already explored the interplay between this uh, compositeness, if you wish, of the gravity now and the uh, weinberg witten uh, theorem? No, so I So for haven't. example, okay, mm -hmm. but you think it is allowed because, because you're saying that uh, this chi, I mean, this spin one half particles shouldn't carry any Lorentz covariant current, right, more or less. No, the spin one half particle is a spin, a spinner. So it, it, it is in a spin one half representation. Uh, I, I suppose that's uh, that's a natural thing. Uh, I mean, no, 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 it, sure. It, but uh, I was just asking if you took a look at that. I mean, if you made sure that uh, it, respect, it avoids in a proper way the Van der Witten theorem, like the graviton does, for example, or, or the photon no. does. Or, Okay. No, that's a very good question. I don't. I haven't studied that problem. Thank okay. You. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. 
we can uh, postpone the other questions if there will be to the discussion. We thank you again, uh, Zanelli, for uh, the presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, we will have a 15 minutes break. Uh, break. Uh, we will uh, start at uh, 4 uh, 10 in uh, Central European time. Thank you. Okay, thanks.